بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الانبياء وعلى اله الاسكيا واصحابه الاتقيا اما بعد so we're continuing on from last week's discussion and last week we started off part 2 of Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi's famous book the beginning of guidance and in part 2 Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi is teaching us those things we need to stay away from so the things that we need to stay away from, things that are not good for us, Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi is telling us how to stay away from them. Now the way he categorizes all the sins that we need to stay away from is by going through the different limbs in the human body. So last week we covered, for example, the sins that are associated to the human eye. Then we also covered the sins that are associated to the ear. And today moving forward, we're going to start with the third one, inshallah, the sins associated with the tongue. Bismillah. As for the tongue, it was created for you only so that you could spend much time in the remembrance of Allah Most High and in recitation of His book, that you could guide Allah's creatures to His way, and that you express your needs in worldly and religious matters. Okay, now remember Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi, he doesn't only take a approach, an instructional approach that stay away from one, two, three, four. That's not all he does. He first gives us a reflection point by saying, what should you have used your tongue for? Why did Allah give it to you? So now that you're reflecting over that, then, Allah, then Imam Ghazali says, don't use it like this because that's being ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he starts off by saying, why did Allah give you your tongue? Allah, just, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give you your tongue so you can rap about profanity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give you your tongue to use it for sin and bad things. This tongue was given by Allah so it can be used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's interesting because in a day, we probably utter somewhere between 7,000 words to 10,000 words on average. And these 7,000 to 10,000 words that we utter in a single day, honestly, if you ask yourself how many of those words even had the name of Allah in it, you'd be baffled. Maybe the name of Allah was said 10 times. Maybe the name of Allah was said 100 times. But where is 7,000, 10,000, and where is 100 times? And it kind of gives you an idea of how the tongue is being used. It is said regarding Dawood alayhi salam that he made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in his dua, he asked Allah for four things, and he told Allah to protect him from four things. What were the four things that he asked for? Lisanan dhakira, wa qalban shakira, wa badanan sabira, wa zawjatan tu'inuni fi dunyaya wa akhirati. He made dua to Allah for four things. And every one of you should make dua for these four things as well. The first thing he says, Oh Allah, Give me a tongue that will always be engaged in your remembrance. Say, Ameen. Amen. Oh Allah, the tongue that will always just remembering Allah, always remembering Allah. Because when you remember something abundantly, that's a sign that you love it. You know, people that, that for example, they like sports. That's the only thing their tongue talks about. For some people who like, for example, cars, the only thing their tongue talks about. For some people who are into, for example, you know, uh, a, a, a particular type of martial arts, that's the only thing their tongue will talk about because that's what they like. People who are doctors, every discussion of theirs, somewhere or the other, medicine will be mentioned because that's what they like. So here, when we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we're always in the remembrance of Allah, that's a sign that we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly. The second thing that he made dua for was qalban shakira. Oh Allah, give me a heart that will always thank you. Because remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favored us with so many things. And we do not want a heart that is ungrateful to Allah. We want a heart that will always be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People that are ungrateful are usually pessimists and they're negative. And negative people can't get far in life. You have to learn to be positive. And you create positivity within yourself by thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what He has given you. Because trust me, whoever you are or whatever background, whatever life you come from, no matter how thug or rough you think it is, there's someone who has it harder than you. There's someone on this planet who has it harder than you. So thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the comparatively easy life. Okay? For the life that you have that is a lot easier, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. And the fourth dua that he made was, Oh Allah, give me a wife who will help me in my worldly affairs and will also be a means of my salvation in the hereafter. That Oh Allah, give me a spouse that will help me in the world. Not someone who will take me down, who will take me into bankruptcy. And oh Allah, give me a spouse that will help me in the hereafter. My spouse shouldn't be the one who forces me into the fire of hell. These are four things he asked for. 
And then he said, oh Allah, protect me from four things. These are very beautiful. The first thing he said, he asked Allah for protection. He said, oh Allah, save me from a child who will become my master. Do not give me a child who will one day rule over me and boss me around. Oh Allah, give me a child who will be obedient. Don't give me a child that will be my master. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with Sulaiman alayhi salam, who was a master to the world, but his kingdom did not come over his father Dawood alayhi salam. Even the jinn used to listen to him, even the birds listened to him, but not over his father Dawood, because his father always made his dua, oh Allah, never give me a son who will be my master. My shaykh used to say that you can be a shaykh for everyone in the world, but you can't be the shaykh for your father. To your father, you'll always be a humble servant. To your father, you'll always be a child. To your parent, you'll always be a child. You can never go and preach your parents. You can advise them, but you can't be a preacher to them. The second thing here, he made dua to Allah, Oh Allah, save me from a wife that will make me old while I'm still young. Oh Allah, imra'atin tushayyibuni qabla waqt al-mashib. Oh Allah, save me from a spouse that will make me old before I become old, because marriage can have that effect on people. The third thing, he said, Oh Allah, save me from wealth that will be a punishment for me and will be a burden against me. I don't want wealth like that. Because some people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them wealth, but as long as soon as they earn that money, their life gets flushed down the toilet. Now they don't have a life anymore. They can't give time to their kids anymore. They can't give time to their family anymore. They're always worried about the next lawsuit. They're always worried about what, to, what needs to be done now, what needs to be done now. And in that worry and fikr, they lose their own life. So he's saying, Oh Allah, give me wealth that will be ease for me. Give me wealth that will be for me, that will make me happy, that will give comfort to me, that won't bog me down. And the last dua he said was, Oh Allah, save me, from an, save me from a neighbor. Save me from such a neighbor that if he sees my good, he hides it, but if he sees my evil, he spreads it. Oh Allah, I don't want a neighbor like that. That whenever he sees my good, he doesn't tell anyone about it. Because you should talk about the good in other people. But this guy hides my good. And if he sees me make a single mistake, a single slip up, he tells the entire world that, you know, the other day I saw police outside his house. Now maybe the police came there because you called them because someone was harassing you. But they're not going to look at it that way. They're going to say, maybe someone arrested him. The cops came to his house. You know, don't have your kids married into that house anymore. Watch out for these people. They're all crooks. So he's saying here, oh Allah, save me from a neighbor who gives me a bad image who gives a bad image of me in the eyes of people. So these were the four du'as of Dawood The second thing Imam Ghazali says, Allah gave you this tongue to read the Qur'an. You know, and I always tell my friends this, minus the month of Ramadan, seriously ask yourself, when is the last time you sat with the Qur'an to read it? And if you're thinking of maybe a week ago, or maybe a few months ago, that's a source of shame. And I speak to myself first, I'm not putting fingers at anyone, I speak to myself, that what, I, what right of the Qur'an have I fulfilled by reading it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me this tongue for this reason. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to tell me, for example, if I gave you a car to deliver pizzas, and you use that car to take your girlfriend out, you use that car for your own personal business, you use that car to drive your parents around town, but you're not delivering pizza, what would I end up doing? I would take it away, right? Sit down, I'd say, brother, give me that car back. You're not using it for delivering pizza. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you this tongue to engage in His remembrance, if Allah gave you this tongue to read His book, and at the end of it, if we don't do that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ultimate right to say, give me that tongue back. And if Allah takes his tongue away from us, then what will we say after that? So use this tongue. Every day open the Qur'an a little bit and read it. You'll be amazed. There was one girl, she contacted me. She was in university. This is from another country, by the way. A girl contacted me from another country. She said, Sheikh, I was in university. And while I was studying in university, I met this guy. And we started hanging out with each other. We got to some things that we shouldn't have been doing and we did certain acts that were not allowed in Islam right and then she said to me that Sheikh um, I'm so disgusted with myself that even when I go to the washroom I cry I can't look at myself in the mirror anymore I'm so disgusted with myself I can't even smile in front of people because I feel like I've committed a sin that I don't know whether Allah will forgive me or not Allah will forgive her inshallah that's another discussion but I'm just trying to say what she's going through because of what she did okay um, then she said to me that I knew this was wrong, my parents told me that this was bad, I know culturally it was a bad thing. But one day I was sitting in the masjid, and I picked up the Qur'an and I started reading it, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Qur'an that safeguard your private parts and keep them clean. Purify your private parts. And when I read this in the Qur'an, it hit me that I did a bad job at fulfilling this verse of the Qur'an. One verse of the Qur'an changed her life. What was it? Just one verse of the Qur'an changed her life. 
And now she's crying and making tawbah. She started memorizing the Qur'an. Literally, this girl changed her entire life. She left that guy, never talked to him again. Changed her entire life because of the power of the Qur'an. But if you don't read the Qur'an, then how can you ever expect the Qur'an to have an impact on you? The Qur'an has miracles, but you have to open that treasure box first. Okay? Then after that, he says that Allah gave you this tongue so you can guide people towards Islam. You don't realize, but a single word of yours can be a guidance for people for Islam. Just as you can turn people away from Islam with a single word, you can guide people towards Islam. And then after that he says, the reason why Allah gave you this tongue is so that you can beg Allah for what, you, what is hidden inside your heart from, the de- from the, your needs for this worldly life in the hereafter. Anything you need, ask Allah. That's why Allah gave you this tongue, so you can come and beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now he goes to the next part of the discussion. Yes. If you then use it for other than what it was created for, you have been ungrateful for Allah's blessing. The tongue is the part of the body most able to overpower both you and other creatures. The tongue is that part of the body that has the ability to overpower you and other people. It's not always strength that is used to overpower someone. Sometimes someone can be puny and thin, but they can overpower you with their, with their tongue. Their tongue is so powerful. You know, it's known regarding Hassan bin Thabit radiallahu anhu. He was a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who was a great poet. And you know, in those days, you know how in our days we have media. So if someone publishes an article against you, or they, they have a little, they give they dedicate even a minute of any any major news station to um, defaming a particular person. That person is absolutely defamed. In those days, the way they defamed people, their medium of you know mass media marketing was poetry. So if a famous poet said something, everyone would say, that's it. You know, this guy is right. So there was a poet who spoke out against the Prophet ﷺ. Now, when he spoke out against the Prophet ﷺ, he said things. How would you and I deal with it? We'd probably say, let's go beat that guy up, get him in a headlock and beat this guy up. The Prophet ﷺ says, no, we're going to fight their battle back with them. If they think that they have poetry, they'll show them what we have. And the Prophet says to Hassan bin Thabit, it's your turn now to come forward and defeat the enemy. And Hassan bin Thabit doesn't have to go and work out his biceps and go and punch that guy or anything. He just starts singing his poetry. And his poetry for the Prophet ﷺ was so beautiful that the positivity he brings to the stage eliminates all the negativity from the opposition. And, and Hassan bin Thabit, by the way, it was known regarding him that he was a great poet, but in terms of strength, in terms of a fighter, he had never... He, I don't want to say he had never, because that's a little pushing it. But he wasn't the best warrior to have next to you in a battlefield. There's one incident that the, that the Muslims were in a battle, and the women were at the back, and the Prophet ﷺ told Hassan bin Thabit, you're supposed to guard the women. He said, I got this. <laughs> the enemy started coming in that direction. They said to him, Hassan, come on, do something. He said, guys, I can sing some poetry. I don't do this sword business, right? So one of the women said, if you're not going to do it, then, and then she picked up the sword and ran after that guy, and like she knocked that guy down, right? But it's not to speak down upon Hassan and Thabit. That's not the intention here. The point that I'm making is that everyone has a skill. And the tongue is that one limb of the body that if used, it's actually, if a person wants, it's, uh, it's like an arrow wrapped in poison. But if you want, that very same tongue can now be one that is dipped inside honey. That's what the Prophet ﷺ says in one hadith. Every morning, the entire body says to the tongue before you wake up. You know, before you wake up and you're about to wake up, the entire body says to the tongue, Dear tongue, on behalf of the body, we ask you to please be good. Right? If you mess up, we're going to mess up too. Because your impact is going to come on to us. So your tongue corrupts you, and it corrupts other people as well. So be careful of what your tongue says. You know, um, the Arabic poet he says, "Ihfad lisanak ayyuh al-insan la yaldaghannak innahu thu'ban." And some say this is Imam Shafi'i rahmatullahi alayhi's poem. And what does he say? He says that protect protect your tongue, ihfad lisanak. Protect your tongue, ayyuh al-insan, O human being, la yaldaghannak innahu thu'ban. Because if you're not careful, that tongue may come and bite you because it's like a it's like a snake. It's very dangerous to come back and bite you. And then he says that there are so many people that are lying in their graves because their tongues killed them. It's not the sword that killed them, their tongues killed them. And now when they stand in front of Allah on the Day of Judgment, they will have been the most, the most courageous people were defeated, sometimes because of the power of the tongue. So be very careful of how you use your tongue. Yes. Quote, people are not thrown into hell. This is a hadith, by the way. Now this quote is a hadith. 
People are not thrown into hell on their faces for anything more than the harvest of their tongues. The Prophet said to the Sahabi, that, oh, the, he said to the Sahaba that the one thing that causes most people to go to the fire of hell is they can't control their tongue. You know, when you get hot-headed, you say something, you don't mean it, you can't take it back now. It's gone. And once you've said it, it's gone. You know, people are going to take effect of what you said. So you have to learn to control your mouth. That's what the Prophet wasallam said. The strong one isn't the one who can slam the other guy down. You guys remember that hadith? The strong one is not the one who beats his opponent. Who was the strong one? Who can control himself at the time of anger. That's the real battle. Because when you're angry, you feel that burn in your heart. And you're telling yourself, don't say anything. But you're pushing. The other side of you is saying, do it, do it. And you're saying, no, no. And you know that burn you feel in your heart? That's what you call, you know, spiritual strength. It's like, you know, that spiritual strength that you're building at that moment. Yes. Struggle to gain victory over your tongue with all your might, lest it throw you onto your, uh, lest it throw you onto your face in a pit of hell. For it has been narrated in a hadith, Verily, a man might utter a single word, and for this one word he is hurled to the depths of hell, a distance of 70 years. Sometimes a single word of yours can make you be tossed in the fire of hell, and you will fall in the fire of hell for 70 years. And Allama Munawi, rahmatullahi alayhi, who was a great commentator of hadith, he says 70 years actually means forever. Because 70 is for takthir, it's for abundance. And that means that this person may be in the fire of hell forever. So be careful with what you say. Yes. A martyr was now he narrates a story. Yes, famous story. A martyr was killed in battle. and some This battle was the battle of Uh, oh, There was a person that was killed. Yes. And someone said of him, How lucky is he? He has earned paradise. The Prophet ﷺ said, How do you know? It may be that he used to speak of that which he did not concern him. Or was miserly over things which were of no benefit to him anyway. The Prophet said, the Prophet didn't say he's not going to paradise. Look at the way the Prophet worded it. He said, how do you know? Maybe this guy used to talk about things that didn't concern him. Maybe he did a lot of chit chat. And maybe he was miserly with things that did not benefit him at all. Meaning his wealth. Maybe he was overly stingy and he spoke about things that weren't beneficial to him. So the Prophet is highlighting these are things you want to stay away from. Because not controlling your tongue can be a barrier between you and Jannah. Not spending generously could be a barrier between you and Jannah. You know, um, speaking about things that relate to you is important. If someone else has a problem, you don't get involved unless they ask you to get involved. Don't, mind, don't put your nose into other people's business. Focus on your life. You know, we're too busy fighting and defending on, uh, on behalf of other people that we forget to focus on our own lives. You know, we've been a shield for everyone, but what about for yourself? What about developing yourself as an individual? Everyone has their nose in, er their nose in everyone else's business. But what about your own business? So we're talking about what's happening in that person's marriage, what's wrong with that person's kid, how this person has this problem at school, how that person has this health issue, this person has this masjid issue, that masjid has this board issue, that board has this president issue. Everyone's talking about everything. But what's happening in your life? You know, what have you done with your life so far? You're 25 years old, you're 30 years old, what have you done? You know, what kind of education have you put together? Have you pleased Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How is your health? How is your relationship with your mother? How is your relationship with your friends? Let's talk about things that are important. Forget about them. They're not important because Allah is not going to ask you about them on the Day of Judgment. Allah is going to ask you about you. And that's what matters right now. So here Imam Ghazali, alayhi, he's saying this, don't talk about things that don't relate to you. It is narrated from Luqman. Luqman the wise. You guys have all heard of him before? Yes, he's referenced in the Quran, Luqman the wise. Someone asked Luqman, how did you gain your wisdom? How did you gain wisdom? He gave a very profound answer. He said, I close my mouth, Allah opened my heart. I stopped talking unnecessarily, and Allah showered wisdom on my heart. Luqman Hakim said, that لَوْ كَانَ الْكَلَامُ مِنْ فِضَّةً كَانَ السُّكُوتُ مِنْ ذَهَبٍ He said, if speaking is considered as silver, then silence is gold. And similarly, there is a statement from Ibn Mubarak, rahmatullahi alayhi. He said, لَوْ كَانَ الْكَلَامُ فِي طَاعَةِ اللَّهِ مِنْ فِضَّةً If speaking about the obedience of Allah is silver, then silence from the ma'asiyah, from the disobedience of Allah, is gold. So silence is something better for you than speaking bad. If you're going to speak, speak good, otherwise keep it quiet. Now Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi says, I've talked about the importance of controlling your tongue. I will highlight here eight major things you need to watch out for. How many things? Eight. Thamaniya. I'm going to highlight to you eight things that you need to be careful of. Now remember this book right here is a summary of the Ihya ul din the original is the Ahya ul din In the Ahya ul din Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi has dedicated an entire chapter to Afatul Lisan, which means the diseases of the tongue. And there, 
He doesn't discuss eight. He discusses 20 there. That's a book to read. That's a very really good... Maybe one day we can have a seminar on that. The 20 Diseases of the Tongue. It's a very powerful chapter. I taught this before some years ago in the Displains Potter Masjid, for those of you who remember. But anyway, here Imam Ghazali, he covers eight of them. Today, inshallah, we'll try to go through four of them and we'll leave the next four for our next class, inshallah. Bismillah. Number one, lying. Guard your tongue from lying both in seriousness and in jest. Seriousness is in jest. Because if you lie when you're joking, then you'll end up lying when you're serious. And if you lie when you're serious and lie when you're joking, then people are never going to know when to trust you and when not to trust you. And your trust is your dignity. If you have no trust, you have no dignity. You know, as an imam, I know that there are certain people, and not to be judgmental, but you just know that certain people, they have done a very good job at always making up stories when they're presenting their side of the story to you. They always do a good job. But you, 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 you learn to realize that at some point you can't even trust people anymore. At some point you're like, I have to hear both sides of the story. That's why as a judge, a Muslim leader or a Muslim community leader, you're not supposed to give a verdict until you hear both sides of the story. Because one person may be very good. You know, there's a famous incident that a lady came to Qadi Shuraih. Qadi Shuraih was a student of Ali radiallahu anhu. A lady came to Qadi Shuray and she placed a complaint in front of Qadi Shuray. And she was crying and crying and crying the whole nine yard, right? She was like, you know, like this and crying and sad, her eyes were swollen. So Qadi Shuray said to her, Tell me your story. So she was, you know, kind of like just crying her way through the story. Then after she was done, he said, Now call the other, pers- other party, I want to hear their story. So everyone else sitting there said, Qadi, are you really going to torture this lady so much that you're going to invite that other person? and make him give his testimony. Look at her, she can never lie. What do they say? Look at her, she can never lie. So Qadi Shuray was such a wise man. He said if crying was a sign of testimony, it was a, was a sign of truthfulness and testimony, then explain to me the ayah of the Qur'an, وَجَاءُوا أَبَاهُمْ عِشَاءً يَبْكُونَ Anyone know where that ayah is from? Surah Yusuf. And when is that ayah? that they took Yusuf salam, they dumped him in the well, they took his kurta, covered it in blood, they came back to their father and they were crying, Oh, dad, he died. They started crying. وَجَاءُوا أَبَاهُمْ عِشَاءً يَبْكُونَ And Allah, and, and Qadi Shuri says, if crying was a sign of being truthful, then tell me how did they lie to their father while they were crying. So you don't judge people simply by what they say. And a lot of times people lose their trustworthiness because they're not truthful. So you have to be truthful in every matter. Even the Prophet ﷺ, one day the Prophet was joking with the companions and someone said, O Messenger of Allah, why do you joke? The Prophet said, even in my jokes, I only speak the truth. I don't lie in my jokes either. Being truthful is very important because if you can't be truthful, you can't be trusted. Your spouse can't trust you, your kids can't trust you, your siblings can't trust you, your employer can't trust you, no one can trust you. When you can't be trusted, then there is no value for you. Ji. Do not let it get accustomed to lying in jest. Don't let it get accustomed because when you get addicted to lying, then stepping out of that addiction is pain. So don't become addicted to it. Sometimes you have to live with the truth and say it. You may have to face the consequences, but that will teach you to deal with reality and not to hide behind false words. So for example, if I did something wrong, I broke into this door. Now someone asks me, did you break into it? I can say no, and I can get away with it. Or I can say yes, I can be punished for it, and I'll never break into a door again. You guys understand? So you have to man up sometimes and say, I did it. Yes. And if I deserve a punishment, let it be. That's my truthfulness. And I can lie to you, but what about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You know, there are tens of narrations like this. There was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were going on the battle of um, Tabuk. And when they were going on the battle of Tabuk, it was a very big battle. It was the first time the Muslims were fighting against the Romans. I mean, this was... Muslims were always fighting against Arabs. This was now, let's go against the Roman Empire. So when they were going, there was one Sahabi by the name of Ka'b radiallahu an, Ka'b bin Malik. No, I'm sorry. Is it Ka'b bin Malik? Yeah, Ka'b bin Malik radiallahu an. He was supposed to be with the, he was supposed to join the army. He was a very good Sahabi. Um, when the army left, he thought to himself, you know, I have a good horse. Let me rest in one more day at home. Tomorrow I'll use my fast horse and catch up. The next day he came, he thought, you know what? One more day, my horse is fast. It'll catch up. Three, four days passed by and he realized now the caravan was gone so far he couldn't catch up anymore. So he missed out on the full battle. When the Prophet came back from the battle of Tabuk, everyone came one by one to the Prophet ﷺ. Those who didn't join, they came to give their excuses. Some hypocrite was saying, this was my problem. Everyone was lying. 
When Ka'ab bin Malik's turn came, he came to the front, he said, a Messenger of Allah, he was very honest, real talk. He said, a Messenger of Allah, all these guys, many of them just lied to you right now. You and I both know that, because they were hypocrites, and they were known for hypocrite, their hypocrisy. He said, a Messenger of Allah, I can also lie to you as well. And I know for a fact that I can convince a person when I lie, because I have the ability to speak, I have the ability to convince. But even if I may lie to you, O Messenger of Allah, I can never lie to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I know Allah is always watching me. So I can't get away. If I don't take the punishment in the world, then I will be punished in the hereafter. And I'd rather take the punishment of the world. There was a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ma'iz. You guys know the story of Ma'iz? Ma'iz, he came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Messenger of Allah, Inni qad zanayt, I committed zina. The Prophet said to the Sahaba, Is this guy drunk? So the Ashariba Khamran, is this guy, is he like drunk a little? So someone Sahabi got up, he smelled him, he said, Messenger of Allah, nah, he's not drunk. Abihi Junoon, is he not sane? He said, Messenger of Allah, he's sane. The Prophet said to him, You know, Maiz, go back home and just make tawbah to Allah. Go back home and repent to Allah. He was going back home and he thought to himself, Maybe the Messenger of Allah didn't understand. I committed zina right now, I committed a major sin. He said, I'm going to go back and be truthful again. He said, Messenger of Allah, I did a committed zina. And the Prophet asked the same two questions. Then he said, go back home and make tawbah to Allah. He came back a third time. He said, the Messenger of Allah, I committed zina. And then the Prophet said, go back home and make tawbah. He came back the fourth time. Because he knew that he committed a mistake and he wanted to admit to it. He'd rather live with the punishment. And the Prophet said to him, Maiz, why are you doing this? He said, Messenger of Allah, I'd rather live with the punishment in the world than die within the hereafter. Because I won't be able to deal with that. And the Prophet, and he was a married man. So the Prophet ordered the Sahaba, the punishment was to him, for him to be stoned. And they gathered around and they began to stone him. And when they started stoning him, at one point he tried to run. Because when the stones started hitting him, in it, he kind of realized that this was going to be the, this is it. So he tried to run. When he tried to run, someone took an object and he clotheslined him and knocked him on the face and knocked him right down. And they started hitting him more and more until he died in that state. When the Prophet heard about this later on, he said to that Sahabi, you made a big mistake. When he was trying to run, you should have let him run. Because he was such a sincere person that if he asked Allah for forgiveness on behalf of Medina, Allah would have forgiven the entire Medina Manawara. Never judge a sinner by his sin. Just because someone's gone to prison, just because someone had a little rough background, you don't know what's in their heart, my friends. You know? And, the pro and then a little while later, a lady came. And she's a messenger of Allah. Her name was Imrat al Ghamidiyah. She said, a messenger of Allah, I committed zina. Oh my God, here's another one now. Right? And, the, and then the Prophet said, are you sure? She said, a messenger of Allah, are you going to return me back four times like you returned back Maiz? I was a lady she com he committed zina with. And the Prophet said, are you pregnant? She said, yes. The Prophet said, then come back after your delivery. He was trying to push it off. Do you understand? The Prophet didn't like punishment. He tried to push it off as much as he could. She came back nine months later after delivery. And the Prophet saw, said, how can I take you away and leave this baby alone? Go and suckle the child now. So she breastfed the child for two years, because that's Islamic ruling. After that, she brought the baby back. And this time when the baby came, the hadith says that the young kid had a piece of bread in his hand. And the Prophet, and she said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, let me face the punishment for what I have done. I can't live with this. And then she was also stolen until, he, until she passed away. The reason I mention these stories is because sometimes we're just so afraid of the immediate consequence that we forget about the long-term consequence. I'm not telling anyone to stone anyone here. Neither am I saying you guys need to start hitting each other and clotheslining each other and start whipping each other. That's something that's done under a Muslim government, Muslim rule to the Qadi's whole form, right? format. right? But what I'm saying is you have to be truthful with yourself. And this is a part of being truthful. When you're truthful, even if you admit to something wrong and you're punished for it, at the end of the punishment, you'll respect yourself. Is that right or wrong? And if you lie and you hide it and you continue to lie, you'll never be able to respect yourself because you know you have deceived yourself. You've deceived people. You're a liar. So this is, and Allah says in the Quran, Allah says, our curse is upon those who lie. Yes. Indeed, lying is one of the breeding grounds of the deadly sins. Moreover, if you become known for lying, people will lose confidence in your word, mistrust you, and look down upon you. If you wish to understand how despicable it is... Now Imam Ghazali gives a very beautiful reflection. He says, do you realize how bad lying is? You know when you lie, you feel good, right? Some people when they lie, they feel good. They feel like, I just smarted that guy out. 
You don't realize how bad it is to lie. So Imam Ghazali says, let me teach you how bad it is actually to lie. Go ahead. If you wish to understand how despicable it is to lie, look at the lying of others. Consider how repelled you feel by it. Now imagine someone else lied to you. Forget about you being the liar. Stop for a second. Imagine your brother lied to you. Your son lied to you. Your mother or father lied to you. Your friend lied to you. How would you feel? Go ahead. Consider your disdain for the person who lies and your judgment of his action as immoral. Do this with all of your faults, for you cannot know the ugliness of your own faults except by seeing them in others. Most certainly then, what you have found repugnant in others, they will e find equally repugnant in you. So do not be content with these faults in yourself. Okay, number two. Yes. Breaking a promise. Beware of ever promising something and then not keeping your promise. Rather, let your goodness toward people be in the realm of action, without the need for words. So Imam Ghazali is saying here, first of all, don't make promises. If I need to give you a ride tomorrow, rather than saying, I promise I'll give you a ride, just show up at the car. Let your goodness be through actions without words. Just go and do the good, okay? You know, rather than telling someone, I'll donate 20,000 tomorrow, just bring the 20,000, give it and walk away. So Imam Ghazali is saying, try not to even use the words. But if you have to make a promise, now he says, yes. But if you are forced to make a promise, then be careful not to break it, unless you are incapable of fulfilling it, or you have to do so out of absolute necessity. Now you promise someone I'll be there at 6 p.m. Try to be there at 6 p.m. Try your best to be there at 6 p.m. Now if, for example, you get there 6.15, 6.30 because of there was traffic, or maybe you got lost, or maybe you had to do something, or your tire popped, or, you know, whatever the case is, that's excused. Because that's human, that's it's beyond your capacity, it's beyond human nature, beyond human ability. But Without absolute necessity, if you promise someone to be there at 6 o'clock, you shouldn't leave your house at 6.10, okay? And people, what do they call it, you know, fashionably late. It's not an Islamic concept, okay? It's, a, it's actually far from an Islamic concept, yes. For indeed, breaking a promise is among the signs of hypocrisy and repugnant character. Footnote says, the Prophet wasallam said, if a man promised something to his brother and his intention was to be true to his word, but he was incapable of fulfilling his promise. There is no sin on him. Abu Dawood. Yes. The Prophet wasallam said, There are three qualities which, if they lie hidden within a person, render him a hypocrite. Even if he fasts and prays. When he speaks, he lies. When he makes a promise, he breaks it. And when he is given a trust, he betrays it. Number three. Number three, backbiting. Restrain your tongue from backbiting, for backbiting is a sin more severe for a Muslim than 30 acts of adultery, as is in the narration. If everyone backbites each other, you're going to break the concept of trust within society. That's the crux of it all. You guys understand? If we all speak bad about each other in the community, we, no one will be able to respect anyone. Right? That's why in Islam we say, praise people or just shh, don't say anything. And someone may say, but what I'm saying is true. If what you're saying is true, that's what we call backbiting. If what you're saying is false, then we say backbiting plus slander. It's two mistakes then. Because you're lying, you're slandering, and you're backbiting. It's like you're just adding the sins up. Yes. The meaning of backbiting is that you make mention of someone in a way that he would dislike of it. Mention of someone in a way they would dislike of it. When we say mention, that also refers to writing. Writing about someone. Facebooking about someone. Tweeting about someone. You know, um, text messaging your friends, whatsapping your friends about someone. It's all considered as backbiting. It's not only what's spoken. Any sin that's related to speaking is equivalently the same sin for anything that is written down, anything that is text, anything that is typed in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can hear your words and He can also read what you write. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can read your text messages, my friends. Trust me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can read emails as well, my friends. These things are all open to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot deceive. So remember... Just as you are speaking, you have to keep it clean, keep your conversations clean as well. My sheikh used to always say, you know, as corrupt as political figures may be, they just might get lucky on the Day of Judgment and go to Jannah because of the millions of people across the world that always do their backbiting. And think about this, right? How much do people backbite political figures? This day and night, 
They backbite them so much, so much. And even the pious people of our community at times are backbiting these political figures or these famous figures. He used to say that these people, it's possible that they, may just, they might just end up going to Jannah because of all the backbiting that happens about them. So you're not supposed to backbite. And, and backbiting is not only limited to Muslims, another misconception. You, people think that they can talk bad about a non-Muslim behind their back. No. Backbiting, there's no, there, nowhere does it mention that backbiting is only limited to Muslims or not. It's for everyone. You're not supposed to backbite any person. Yes. Doing so makes you a backbiter and a wrongdoer. Okay. Now there are some scenarios in which it is permissible to backbite. So for example, you're speaking about something bad someone else did to warn another person. You guys understand that? So for example, I can now tell this brother that you know that brother there, he cheated someone in business. So the fact I'm telling him he cheated someone in business is backbiting. But this is permissible because I'm actually warning him. And this is what the Quran does. It talks about Firaun. Firaun's dead. But the reason why the Quran talks about Firaun behind his back is to warn us of the mistakes Firaun made. Similarly, if for example, uh, you're just advising someone that you know, so and so person made this mistake or, or so and so person did this, my advice is don't work that way. So you're warning them or you're advising them. Uh, for example, I'm gonna, advising them, another aspect of looking at the advising thing is that I may say, for example, I dealt with a marriage case as an imam and I saw this is what happened. So I'm telling you that story. So I'm not backbiting them because I'm sharing that advice with you so you can learn a lesson. You guys understand that? Uh, but however, you shouldn't share names because it's best to keep those people anonymous. Yes? Beware of the kind uh, another thing is that sometimes it's permissible to backbite to take it off your chest. You know, like sometimes something, someone might do something to you, and this is very real, by the way. Someone might do something to you and it's just building up on you, build up on you, build up on you. So it's permissible for... I don't use the word it's permissible to backbite to take it off your chest. I'm going to re rephrase that. It's permissible for you to go and share that burden off your chest with someone else. So someone did something wrong to you, sometimes you have to go tell someone. You might want to call your mom and say, Mom, this is what happened today. Or you might want to tell your wife or tell a brother or tell you know, someone in the community, this is what happened. So it's permissible to go and tell someone if that helps you with getting it off your chest. Like people will do if they go to a counselor. You know, or if you went to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, they may ask you to you know, open up a little. So in that case, that's permissible as well. Yes. Beware of the kind of backbiting that is committed by reciters who are showing off. Now Imam Ghazali has this very interesting type of backbiting. He says there is a special genre of backbiting that is called the backbiting of the reciters who show off. You're thinking, what's one of those? I haven't heard of that before. Imam Ghazali explains what that is. Yes. Footnote. No doubt this applies to those who recite the Quran without proper understanding of its deeper meaning, nor apply its counsels to their behavior and conduct. Now he, Imam Ghazali, at this point, now he's going to explain what that refers to. Yes. This form of backbiting is that you make your meaning understood indirectly, saying, for example, May Allah rectify him. I am truly saddened by what has happened to him, and it has worried me. I ask Allah to rectify both us and him. So Imam Ghazali says this is a very shady way of backbiting. What is that? I say, man, Allah have mercy on that Khalid. I told him so many times, but he keeps committing zina. So I'm telling everyone Khalid just committed zina right now, okay? And the reason why Imam Ghazali says this is, the, this is a very shady way of backbiting is because you're making it sound like you care for him, right? Man, Allah have mercy on him. You know, I've advised him so many times. So now you're imposing that, you're implying that you're better than him because you're advising him. At the same time, you're acting like you care for him, but you did not spare him from humiliating him. You guys understand? So Imam Ghazali says this is how some people backbite too. They'll act like they're nice and care. They'll make few du'as here and there too. He says that if you really did care, and if you really wanted to make du'a for him, you didn't, mean, you didn't need to mention his name. You didn't, you didn't need to humiliate him. You could have done all of that without humiliating him. Okay, yes. For indeed, this insinuation is a combination of two reprehensible acts. One is backbiting, since the other person understands the point being made. The other is considering yourself virtuous and praising yourself by passing a judgment of evil on another and expressing righteousness for yourself. However, if your true intention in saying, may Allah rectify him, is supplication, then do supplicate for him, but silently. Imam Ghazali says, if you're really sincere, just do it silently. You don't have to announce to the world that Khalid committed zina. Just do it silently. Yes. If you really were concerned about him, the proof of that, that would have been that you would not have desired to disgrace him or reveal his faults. However, your display of concern over his fault is in reality a display of his fault. Sufficient as a deterrent for you against backbiting are the words of Allah, magnificent and majestic. Quote, and let not some of you backbite others. Would any of you like to eat the flesh of his dead brother? No, you would truly despise that. 
Indeed, Allah likens you to one eating the flesh of the dead. How appropriate is it then for you to be on your guard against such a thing? There is a matter which would stop you from backbiting against Muslims, were you to ponder it. Turn to yourself and consider, is there no flaw in you, apparent or hidden? Now Imam Ghazali is giving you a solution to how to stop backbiting. Imam Ghazali says, ask yourself a question. هَلْ فِيكَ عَيْبٌ ظَاهِرٌ أو باطنٌ? Do you have any fault in you, whether it's hidden or apparent? Ask yourself this question. Fair, listen carefully, okay? Ask yourself this question, do you have any flaws? Whether it's apparent or whether it's hidden. Yes. Are you committing any act of disobedience, open or hidden? Ask yourself a question. Have I committed a sin today, or do I commit sins that nobody knows about, or whether people are aware about? Ask yourself these questions. Yes. If you know this to be so about yourself, know also that the other person's inability to free himself from what you have ascribed to him is the same as your own, and his excuse is the same as yours. Imam Ghazali says, look, if you accept that, look, I have a habit of smoking weed, for example. Now, you're addicted to that. Someone can come and ask you, why don't you stop? What's your response going to be? I'm trying, but I'm, I'm addicted. Straight up, right? So now Imam Ghazali says, if that's your defense for yourself, why don't you use that defense for him then? You follow what I'm saying? Yes or no? Why don't you say that, okay, if he's addicted to, for example, looking at something haram, just as you can't get off your addiction because you're addicted, use the same excuse for him and say, he can't get off it because he's addicted. Imam Ghazali is saying that, defend him just as you would defend yourself. Anyone that you want to backbite, stop for a second and say, what would be my defense if I was in these shoes? And whatever my defense is, that's exactly what his defense would be. Yes. Just as you hate to be shamed and your faults to be mentioned, so too does he. Imam Ghazali says, look, you wouldn't like it if I were to expose you, he wouldn't like it either. So what you like for yourself, like for other people. What you dislike for yourself, dislike for other people. Yes. Yet if you conceal his faults, Allah Most High will conceal yours. If however you disgrace him, Allah will let loose upon you sharp tongues, ruining your honor in this world. Then Allah Most High will shame you in the hereafter in front of all of creation. So if you hide someone else's fault, Allah will hide your fault. And if you expose people, you disgrace people, then Allah will release upon you tongues and they'll come from the forms of mother-in-laws and father-in-laws and next door neighbors and in terms of your clients and everyone, all those tongues are going to come out and they're going to expose you then in this world. And then you will be again exposed in the hereafter. You guys follow this? Now I want to make one point clear here. Sometimes you need to expose someone. If someone is doing something in the form of an oppression, there's nothing wrong with exposing them. That's not considered backbiting. There was a case where I dealt with where there was a sister, her husband was beating her up. And she thought by telling the imam her husband was beating up that she was doing what? Backbiting. And she said, I can't backbite, it's haram, it's haram. I said, sister, may Allah reward you for your taqwa, but we need to deal with this brother right now. So is he hitting you or not? You understand? So sometimes if someone is doing something as an oppression, and it's oppressing you or oppressing someone, there's nothing wrong with warning other people or bringing that person out. So that sort of exposure is not what we're talking about here. Now Imam Ghazali says, okay, stop for a second. So Imam Ghazali was giving us a solution on how to deal with the habit of backbiting. What he said was, what he proposed was, ask yourself, do you have any faults? If you do, then whatever faults you have, whatever defense you have for your faults, use the same defense for him. You guys understand that? Simple and easy. Now the second possibility is that when you look into yourself, you, see, you don't see any faults in you. The first possibility was you, de you did see faults in yourself. The second possibility was that when you reflected to yourself, you realized that I don't have any faults though. So I can't think of how I would defend myself because I don't have any faults and I wouldn't defend myself, so let's just disgrace this guy. So now Imam Ghazali has a very important line or two for you. Please listen very carefully. If you have looked at the outward and inward aspects of yourself and not found any flaw or deficiency, neither in religious nor worldly affairs, then know that your ignorance of your own flaws is the vilest type of stupidity. And there is no greater flaw than stupidity. <laughs> if Allah Most High wills good for you, He will give you the ability to see your faults. Looking at yourself with an eye of satisfaction is the height of foolishness and the epitome of ignorance. There you go, Imam Ghazali laid the smack down there for you. Chalo, ji. If, however, you are truthful and sincere in your opinion, then show gratitude to Allah Most High. Do not ruin this blessing by slandering others and sullying their reputations, for that is one of the greatest of faults. Okay, number four. Four, disputation, argumentation, and competitive debate with people. Imam Ghazali says this idea of always arguing, debating, putting people down. You know, there is always a person usually in each group that just loves arguing. 
You usually have one person that comes to a dinner and just wants to debate with everyone about everything. He'll, he'll debate about what color your shirt is. He'll debate about how much you bought your shirt for. Even though that's, there's no debate there. I bought the shirt, this is how much I bought it for. But he'll find some way to argue that off, that there was a sale somewhere else, and I saw you there, and this is how much you bought it for. So some people, they just love arguing. They get a kick out of it. They love arguing more and more and more. And they like putting people down and slandering them. And this is the age that we live in. You know, you go on YouTube, all you see is people just debating back and forth, slandering each other, right? You know, someone making a video against this sheikh, someone making a video against that sheikh, someone slandering this person, someone debating this person. And each person thinks it's their, you know, their divinely given right for them to stand up for what they consider is quote-unquote the truth and to defend it for as long as there's a soul in their body. And they will fight with their tongue and in their sword and with their fists if they need to. So there's this ego issue. It's just a big ego issue where people can't accept that someone else just might be wrong. If they want to do something, and if it's a legal opinion, if there's supporting behind it, let it be. There's not a need to argue. The Prophet says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like those who abundantly argue. Inna abghad al Allah ta'ala. The most detested person to Allah is the one who, aladdul khasim, who excessively argues and is very vulgar in his debate. Allah does not like these people. Yes. These things entail harming the one being addressed, making him feel ignorant and criticizing him. Even if you're debating about hadith or fiqh, but if it turns into a debate, then sometimes you may end up harming another person. You may end up hurting his feelings. There's a better way of saying it. You guys understand this? Even if it's a religious nature, you may end up hurting that person. Whether you agree with a particular thing in religion or not, there's a nice way to talk about it. Debating may end up hurting another person's feelings. And if you hurt his feelings, what are the chances that he's going to listen to you? The door's closed now. Yes. You feel ignorant in criticizing him, as well as praising oneself and attesting to one's own superiority in both intelligence and knowledge. Moreover, these things disturb the clarity and peace in your life. Because if you, if you debate and argue a lot, do you have any peace in your life? Be honest. We've all been to that phase, right? I went to that phase anyway. When I graduated, I felt the need to debate with every other sect in Islam that existed. I'm telling you, I had already done it. Um, I had debated with all the groups that were out there. Unless you followed the exact training in Islam that I had, I was going to debate you. I had this phase in my life. And I'm telling you, after all the articles and all the columns that I had written, all the, uh, all the research that I had put together, I realized one thing. Every night when I went to sleep, I was just really worked up. It was really, it was really wired up. I just wasn't happy. And then as soon as I stopped that, subhanAllah, I have the best sleep right now. Life is just so much more peaceful because I don't have to worry about arguing with people. I still will convey my point. Don't get me wrong here. If something I feel there's a need to raise my voice, I'll say it. Well, we can discuss it. But the whole debate thing is gone. There's a difference between advising. There's a difference between advising and debating. We don't like debating. We love advising. Ad-deen al Deen is all about advice. Yes. If you debate with a fool, he will annoy you. Now Imam Ghazali says, look, if you debate with someone, there are two types of people. Either you're going to debate with a smart person or a fool. If you debate with a fool, what is he going to do? He's going to annoy you because his arguments are going to be so foolish and when you talk to him, you're going to feel like hitting yourself on the head. Why did I waste my time? You know, I was trying to explain to someone once, you know, I, I know my personal opinion on the, on, the, on the issue of music is that it's not permissible. I tell people that music is not permissible in Islam. Whether there are good words or bad words, in itself, music was something that was detested and disliked by scholars. I do appreciate that there is another opinion and scholars do hold that opinion. So anyway, I was in discussion with a friend and I was telling him, um, that you know, music is something you should stay away from. So he said to me, if music was haram, then why did they call Imam Ghazali Ghazali? He was saying, he was, he was, he was implying that the word Ghazali came from the Urdu word or the Ghazal. You know what Ghazal means? Like a song, right? And they said the reason why they called Ghazali was because he was, because of, because he was a, maybe some musician. I was like, when I heard this from this guy, I held my head and I said, Ya Allah, give me sabr. I can't believe I'm talking to this guy at this point. Because this was the most ridiculous argument I've heard in my life. So sometimes when the, when the opposition, opposition comes back with something foolishness, you just feel like taking a rock and hitting yourself out. So Imam Ghazali is saying, this is what's going to happen if you debate with a fool. Yes. And if you debate with a more intelligent person, he will disdain and dis detest you. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu said, Whoever leaves a quarrel while he is in the wrong, Allah will build him a house on the outskirts of paradise. And whoever leaves a quarrel while he is in the right, Allah will build him a house in the highest part of paradise. So if you're in a debate and you're wrong, the Prophet says, you walk away, Allah will give you a house in Jannah. If you're in a debate and you're right and you walk away, Allah will give you a house in the higher part of Jannah. So if you walk away from a debate, whether you're right or wrong, you're still getting a house in Jannah. Deal or no deal? Deal or no deal? 
That's a straight deal, my friends. You know, if you guys can't see that deal, something's wrong. It's a clear deal. It's very easy. Yes. You should not allow Satan to deceive you when he says, speak the truth clearly and do not dissemble. Satan is always trying to entice foolish people to evil by presenting it to them as goodness. So you know that whole feeling you get, I'm on the haq, I'm on the truth, I gotta voice myself. Imam Ghazali is saying, that's shaitan whispering to you. And shaitan, he comes to foolish people and he makes them think they're doing good and waste their life. You guys understand that? You know, you know unfortunately, Chicago ha has picked up you know, with a lot of street fights and a lot of our Muslim kids are getting involved in this stuff. And what happens is that they feel like they're, what they're doing is right and they get involved with foolish things and they flush their entire life down. You know, and the parents are the ones who sit at home and see their kids going to prison and they think to themselves, man, that was a kid that I gave birth to, that was a kid I gave my life to. And because of some foolishness, look, he's gone. Look, shait, look what Imam Ghazali says here. Shaitan goes to foolish people, he finds like, he hand selects the dummies. He finds them very carefully, he presents, good to, he presents evil to them in the packaging of good, and then he says, please go waste your life. And these dummies do exactly that. So this is what Imam Ghazali is saying. When he's telling you, go and debate, you're on the right, this is shaitan whispering to you. G. Do not become a laughing stock of shaitan, leading him to ridicule, letting him ridicule you. Making the truth clear is a good thing when done with, with someone who will accept it from you. Imam Ghazali says, look, if you want to really tell the person, if you really want to explain the truth, make sure the person you're talking to is willing to listen to the truth first. Yes. This is best accomplished by way of honest, sincere counsel, not disputation. Talk to them nicely. Be kind to them. They'll listen to you. In offering such counsel, there is a po proper form and manner, and it requires gentleness and courtesy. Otherwise, it turns to humiliation of the other person, and its evil outweighs its good. Whoever associates with the pseudo jurist of his time will find his nature increasingly dominated by disputation. Imam Ghazali says, you might find some scholars as well who just love debating. Imam Ghazali doesn't leave the scholars either. He jumps after them as well. He says, you might find some scholars who love getting on you know, on the podium and always debating, debating, debating about fiqh issues, that issue, this issue, that issue, and they think that's the way forward. He addresses that issue, yes. And silence becomes difficult for him. This is because corrupt scholars have influenced him to believe that such disputation bears merit, and that skill in argumentation and competitive debate is indeed what earns him praise. Flee from these scholars as you would from a lion, and know that such disputation is a means of incurring the hatred both of Allah and of creation. Okay. So with that, we finish off the first four. We'll stop here, inshallah. And next week, bi'adhinillahi ta'ala, we'll continue on from five and we'll do the remaining four. We may read a little beyond that as well, but inshallah, we'll start from here as we move forward. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us all to act upon what we learned. Sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabi jma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanallah.